Exactly. So I'm going to be talking about extended field theories in dimension 3 and along the way talking about tensor categories and how they're related to Hopf algebras. OK, so we did dimensions 1 and 2. So the next natural thing is to try dimension 3. So suppose we just try to do the same thing, and we look at ordinary um, three-dimensional TFTs, by which I mean in the same sense as before. So we're given a functor from the Bordism category whose objects are two manifolds and morphisms are three manifolds to vect. So let's think about what kind of data that provides. So, well, we have some vector space associated to the sphere. Let's call it V0. And we have some vector space associated to the genus 1 surface and genus 2 and so on. So we have this whole collection of vector spaces. And then now what three-dimensional bordisms do we have? Well, there's a bordism from the empty manifold to the sphere, just the solid ball, if you will. And so that goes to some map from, um, from C to V0. And then we could go the other way. So that's some map from V0 to C. And now there are other things we can do if we had, say, two surfaces, say this one has genus G and this one has genus H, then we could um, glue a handle between them and go to a surface that has genus G plus H all together. And so that gives us some map from VG tensor VH to V G plus H. So things are looking good so far. But then there's, there's one more thing you can do, which I'll um, kind of tuck in the corner here. So suppose I have some surface, then I can glue a, if I have some simple closed curve in here, I can glue on a one handle. So if I take some curve, wraps around in some way, I can uh, sorry, glue on a two-handle to that to produce some other surface. And so that produces some map from whatever vector space this was to some, the result of the, that two-handle addition. And so the problem is that suddenly we don't have, suddenly the, um, the set of all simple closed curves came in and the sort of collection of data looks a bit uncontrollable. And so you end up deciding that this is really not a workable approach. And so then the next idea is, well, we worked pretty well when we started with circles in the two-dimensional case because all the structure was living on this one vector space. So could we start with circles here as well? And that leads us to the notion of extended TFTs. So again, it's sort of ask, can we start with circles? And the answer is yes. And we can do that by looking at um, <clears throat> what I'll call board 1, 3. So this is now something that has information about one manifolds, two manifolds, and three manifolds. So we're going to study board 1, 3. So this thing has objects, are one manifolds, say like the circle. The morphisms are two manifolds that are bordisms, like that. And then there are now two morphisms as well, which are now three manifolds. So these are things that look like this. So I start with some source manifold, and then I have some target two manifold, and I just have a 
product map on the boundary, and then I have some three manifold filling it in. Um, so this thing is a two category. Um, so what does that mean? Well, let me let me sort of abbreviate these different pieces of data as follows. I'm going to abbreviate the objects just by a point and the morphisms by a line and then the two morphisms by a little bygone like this. And so this thing is a two category, which means I have various composition rules between these different morphisms. So for instance, I can, if I have two one morphisms, I can compose them. And if I have two two morphisms where the target of one is the source of the next, I can compose them vertically like that. But then there's yet another thing I can do, which is that I could stack these three manifolds side to side. So I also have a composition which in this abbreviated notation would look like this. And so, so these are the three composition operations in this two category. And then um, there's a condition, which is that if I first take two morphisms and glue them vertically, and then I glue those to the vertical gluing of two other two morphisms, that's the same as gluing horizontally and then gluing vertically. So uh, the corresponding things in corresponding places are the same two morphism. And I'm saying that these two different ways of composing them are equal. And so that's the basic condition for this to be a two category. And indeed, you can imagine with three manifolds, you can glue this way and then this way or the other way around. And up to diffeomorphism, it doesn't matter. And so as before, really at the top, I want to mod out by diffeomorphism rel boundary. Um, so this thing is not just a two category. It's actually a symmetric monoidal two category, which means that it, with disjoint union. So again, it has a commutative multiplication disjoint union. Um, I'm not really going to talk about that in detail. Okay, so this is sort of the our idea for the geometry we want to start with. And so um, the question is now, what should the algebra be? Sort of what should we map to? That is, we want some functor out of this geometric bordism category into some, some kind of target. And so this thing, again, should be some kind of two category, some symmetric monoidal two category. And it should be built out of algebra, because we want some kind of algebraic invariance of our manifolds. Um, and so the idea for what we're going to take for C is roughly the following. So we want, what do we want to happen on closed two manifolds? So back over here, if we had a closed two manifold, it went to a vector space. So we'd like to recover that same data. So we want closed two manifolds to go to vector spaces. So um, what we're going to do is we're going to encode a vector space, say, V, as a functor from the category of vector spaces to itself given by tensoring with V. So if I have a vector space, I can do this a priori slightly weird thing and think about it as a functor from vec to vec by tensoring with that fixed vector space. And um, <clears throat> in these, um, in this bordism category, we have the empty one manifold. And what we're going to do is assign that empty one manifold to that empty one manifold the category of vector spaces. So assign to the empty one manifold, this is a one manifold, 
the category of vector spaces. So this kind of achieves what we wanted, because now if I have a two-manifold, closed two-manifold, it has empty boundary, and so it's going to be some map from vec to vec, which is the kind of thing that can be encoded as an individual vector space. So what is, uh, what is the category vector spaces? Well, it's a linear category, where by linear I mean the HOM spaces are themselves vector spaces. Um, and so then the idea is that other one manifolds besides the empty one manifold are themselves going to go to other linear categories. So that was just motivational. So now let me tell you what I uh, mean by linear category and set things up a bit more. So a category is linear if, first of all, HOM, say let's call it C, HOM um, between any two objects in this category is a vector space. and the composition is bilinear. Another way to say this is that the category is enriched in vector spaces, just terminology for the same thing. And so we're going to restrict um, attention to particular kinds of linear categories. So the first restriction is we're going to assume um, that we can take direct sums in our category and things that have useful constructions like that. So one way to say that is that a linear category is additive if it has um, all finite coproducts. And we're going to assume that our linear categories are additive. So now we can choose the target to category C, that curly C from down there, to be what I'll denote lincat. So this thing has objects which are additive linear categories, and the morphisms are linear functors and the two morphisms are natural transformations of linear functors. Um, <clears throat> so you can think, well, you can think back through and think that that does actually implement what we wanted in terms of recovering this kind of data just on closed two manifolds and the three manifold bordisms between them. Yeah. Um, well, here we don't need to mod out by, by anything. Just like in VECT, you don't need to mod out the morphisms by anything because they're already rigid, so to speak. Okay, um, but we're going to actually assume a, yet a bit more. So, so in fact, we're going to assume that our linear categories are semi-simple. I'll explain what that means presently. So first of all, what does it mean for an object to be simple? So if C is some, so C is some linear category and A is some object, so this is simple if it has no proper subobjects. That is, you can't map anything smaller into it in a non-trivial way. So it's sort of it's irreducible, um, just in a naive sense. Um, and so then a category semi-simple if everything splits up into simples. So C is semi-simple if every object 
is a direct sum of finitely many simples. So the reason I said it, uh, the reason I didn't put the semi-simplicity assumption in actually into the definition is it turns out you can prove that if you have a um, extended three-dimensional field theory with target linear categories that the image of the circle is semi-simple. You don't need to assume it. And in fact, we might even see a proof um, tomorrow or Friday. But for now, I'm just going to assume that it's the case and that will make our lives easier. Okay, but this was supposed to have some kind of monoidal structure. So I need to talk about that briefly. So I need some map from, if I have two linear categories, um, I need to be able to take their product. And I'm actually not going to discuss this in detail, um, but I just want to give an example of what it looks like. So what's kind of a great way of getting linear categories? Well, one way is to think about the representation category of some algebra. Think about all the representations over an algebra. So a particular kind of linear category is A mod for A some algebra. And if I, so if I took two gadgets like that, A mod and B mod, then their tensor product as linear categories is going to be equivalent to representations of the tensor product. So you can kind of have this in mind as what um, is going on. And then another useful fact that we'll use is that if, so if C is some linear category and it has simple objects a collection of simple objects C sub i, and D is some other linear category with simple objects D sub i, then this tensor that I haven't defined has simple objects given by these sort of formal elementary tensors C sub i tensor D sub j. So kind of you can think about one categorical level down, you can think about vector spaces. If you had some basis for one vector space and a basis for another, then you have a basis for the tensor product that looks like this. This is just the categorified version of that statement. So with all that in place, we can actually define an extended um, 3D TFT, which is also sometimes called the 1 plus 1 plus 1 dimensional TFT, is a symmetric monoidal functor from board 1, 3 into linear categories. Um, and as I said, if you restrict such a thing to closed two manifolds, you get an ordinary two plus one dimensional TFT. Question? Right. So, so the, and I, I suppose composition now is well defined modulo isomorphism by a two morphism. Modulo a two isomorphism. Mm. And then the identity morphism. No, no you really. You really want to set things up so that composition is well defined on the nose, yeah. And that might take that might take being more precise about various things that gives you enough information to really glue precisely. I mean, the, but the way you got a TFT 2.3 was, uh, 
You mean here? So here I'm just okay. Yep. Okay. Um, so now the next. So now the next thing to do. We suppose we have one of these things. Let's do what we did for the lower dimensions and study what kind of structure we get on the image of the circle. So I'm going to call the image of the circle the fusion category. Um, I'll explain why. So suppose we're given one of these gadgets. Then the circle is going to some linear category C. <clears throat> and as before, we have this pair of pants, which goes to some map from C tensor C to C. And this operation is called fusion. And so this category, this category has a tensor structure, and that tensor operation is called fusion. I should say, so when I, um, I probably will use the word tensor and the word monoidal more or less interchangeably. Roughly speaking, um, tensor tends to connote that the underlying category is a linear category, whereas monoidal tends not to implicitly um, have that assumption. So, but C is a linear category, so I have C and uh, a monoidal structure, and so I refer to the whole thing as a tensor category. Um, and I really want to have the unit as well, so this is some functor from vect into C that behaves like a unit with respect to this product, so this all gets put together into the statement that C is a tensor category. OK, so, um, well, sorry. And again, so I've mapped from vect to C, and I can think about the image of just C under that, which is some object of C, which I define, I denote by 1. So 1 is some object of C. This functor is encoded just by that object. Why is that? Well, I assumed all my functors were linear. And so if I take a bunch of direct sums of copies of C, they map to direct sums of copies of the unit. So the whole functor is really determined by what it does just on this one-dimensional vector space. OK, so maybe I can fit it over here. So the first proposition is that the fusion category has finitely many simple objects. So again, this is some categorical analog of what we saw in the lower dimensions, that the vector spaces were finite. So sort of a sketch of the proof. So as before, we had these ordisms like this. And the, the same argument that we gave before um, implies that the category C is spanned by the collection of objects di, where the di were defined by this coproduct operation. So this coproduct, which is some morphism in board 1.3, goes to some map from vect to C tensor C. And so the unit C goes to a finite sum, sum from 1 to n, of CI tensor DI. Sorry, it might be a little hard to see in the corner there. But it's literally just the same argument as before. And then you, so once you have that coproduct, you stick in some object in the front, and it spits out the same object, but rewritten as a sum of some multiplicities time these, times these simple objects DI. And so that shows that C is spanned by this finite number, this finite collection of objects, d sub i. And so that's going to be quite important because um, 
this afternoon, starting on the algebra side, we're going to be hunting for uh, linear categories with, well, linear tensor categories with finitely many simple objects. Okay, so the next thing that I want to do is think about how we might produce some tensor categories. And we've said, well, the one thing we've seen is that if we take A mod for some algebra A, we get a linear category. So we might ask, um, you know, we might ask um, when is the category of A modules actually a tensor category? That is, what kind of structure do we need on A in order to uh, in order to give this tensor structure? And to go along with it, we saw um, in the first hour that it was quite nice if it was a quite nice property of a category if all of the objects had duals. So, in the category of vector spaces, in the category of finite dimensional vector spaces, any object has a dual, and we're often used to thinking about finite dimensional representations of some algebra and thinking about the dual representation. Um, for instance, well, if you're thinking about the representations of a Lie group or something like that, then there exists a dual representation. And so we might similarly ask, when um, do all the objects of this category have duals? So when, what structure do we need on an algebra to ensure that we have dual representations? OK, so, um, and the basic answer to this question is that if A is a Hopf algebra, then A mod is a tensor category with duals. So by with duals, I mean all the objects have duals. Um, OK, so I haven't said what Hopf algebra is, but we're going to see that along the way by just trying to answer these questions. So what's the situation? So I want a tensor product on A mod. So if I have one A module and I have another A module, I want to be able to build some, a single A module from both of them. And I can forget the A module structure and just think about the underlying vector spaces. And I certainly know how to take the tensor product of vector spaces. So the situation is the following. I have M cross N. Um, uh, well, I guess. Let me actually think about the tensor product of these categories. So I have the external tensor of M and N. And that maps down to just the underlying vector spaces. And those get multiplied to the actual tensor product, M tensor N. And so the, the question is whether or not I can put an A module structure on M tensor N because we certainly want this tensor product to respect the forgetful functor to vect. So, um, so just to summarize that, we want an A module structure on M tensor N. And we want it, we want it to not be a stupid structure either. So for instance, there are various things. So if we have some element A, we're trying to act on M tensor N. You might, for instance, just act on M on the left side. But that's not going to give a, it's not going to give a tensor with very good properties. For instance, it won't give something that has units on both sides and it's completely asymmetric. So 
it kind of, I won't go into detail, but it fails lots of conditions that we need this to satisfy. We need some kind of symmetric way to let A act on the tensor. Here, these are meant to be little. This is an, and little m is an element of big M, and little n is an element of big N. So what do we need in order to have some kind of symmetric operation like this? We need some map delta from A to A tensor A. And then we can take this element and split it apart using delta and then act on both sides. So let's try that. Um, <clears throat> so, so given such a co-product operation, delta, let me write delta of A equals sum of delta 1, so sum over I of delta 1, I of A tensor delta 2, I of A. And in fact, I'm often going to drop the sum and the little i indices, so I might abbreviate this whole thing just by delta 1 A tensor delta 2 A, and the sum is implicit. Um, so then, well, what's the idea? We're going to define A times we're going to define this action of A on M tensor N to be delta of delta 1 A acting on M tensor delta 2 A acting on N. Sorry. Um, okay, and so now that's all well and good, but we need to somehow um, ensure that this actually does define an A-module structure on the tensor product of M and N. So let's check that. So so for this to be an action, what do we need? Well, so we start with, say, little m tensor little n, and we're going to act on it by the product of two elements A and B, and we need that to be the same as first acting by B and then acting by A. So let's write out both those conditions. So this first one is, by definition, delta 1 of AB on M tensor delta 2 of AB on N, and this one over here is delta 1 on A, delta 1 on B times M tensor, delta 2 of A times delta 2 of B acting on N, just by the definition I wrote down. So these two things are supposed to be equal, so let's see what that condition looks like on delta. So. On the right side, what did we do? Well, let me do sort of a graphical notation. I first took A and B and I multiplied them, and then I took the coproduct, delta. And over on the right-hand side here, I first took the coproduct of A, and then I took the coproduct of B, and then I multiplied the first factor of A by the first factor of B and multiplied the second factor of A by the second factor of B. And so these two things have to be equal. And this, is, this condition is called the bialgebra condition. So if you have an algebra together with a coproduct satisfying this condition, then it's called a bialgebra. Um, let me write that down explicitly. Okay. 
So A is a bialgebra if it has the following. So first of all, it has some product, which I'll denote like this. And there's a unit for that product. So I'm going to denote the unit. I think of it as a map from nothing to the algebra, which is represented by one strand. And together, those form a unital associative algebra. And then I also have a coproduct, which has a co-unit. And together, those form a co-unital co-associative co-algebra. And then it needs to satisfy some conditions, the most important of which is the one written there, that this is equal to co-product like that. And then the units need to also satisfy some conditions. So if I take the unit and then co-multiply, that's the same as just taking 2 times the unit. And similarly, if I multiply and then take the co-unit, that's the same as just taking 2 copies of the co-unit. And finally, if I take the unit and then take the co-unit of that, it's the same as not doing anything at all, which is to say it's the identity map on the complex numbers. OK. so. That's, uh, that's a bialgebra, and the, where a Hopf algebra is going to be a bialgebra with yet some more structure. But we're doing things one step at a time. So um, what have we seen? Well, we've seen that this first condition ensures that, um, that the action, that we actually did produce an A module structure on M tensor N. And I guess I'll leave it as an exercise to think through what role do these last three conditions uh, play in making sure that we constructed a tensor category. So what role do those last three conditions play? in ensuring that A mod is a tensor category. OK. Is there a question? OK. Perfect. So just to, to be clear, the statement that we've established modulo this exercise is that if A is a bialgebra, then the category of um, A modules is a tensor category. So now let's think about this second question. What more do we need to know about A to know that we can take dual representations? Um, Well, so so now what do we want? We want some map from A mod. We'd like to build a map from A mod to A mod that takes something to its dual representation. So again, we're going to want to preserve the forgetful functor to vect. So we have some representation, I guess now I'm calling it V. So that maps down to V. And then, well, the dual vector space is V star, by which I mean HOM from V to C. And so again, what we would like to do is build an A module structure on the linear dual of any representation. So that is want an A module structure on V star, by which I mean HOM from V to C. So we have A, and suppose we have some linear functional F, and we're going to evaluate it on some vector, and we need to 
see what that could be. Well, there are not so many things you can imagine doing, and one of them is the following. Suppose we have a map, I'll call S from A to A, then we can define such a something we might hope to be this action by pre-composing with S. That is, we define the action on a functional the val the, to be the functional that first acts by S of A and um, then evaluates the functional. So that's a reasonable thing to guess, but now, as before, we need to ensure that this really is um, an action. So, so for this to be an action, what do we need? Well, we first, so if we have A and B and we act on F and evaluate that, that ought to be the same as first acting by B and then by A and evaluating. So here, what do we get? We get F of S of AB acting. And over here, we get F of S of B, S of A of V. And so if we want these two things to be equal, then what we need is that S is an anti-homomorphism of the algebra structure. That is, S of A, B is S of B, S of A. S is called the antipode, by the way. OK, so what have we done so far? Well, we've defined an A-module structure on the linear dual V. So that's good. That gives us some map from A-mod to A-mod that um, takes V to V star. But we haven't actually established that that A-module is a dual for the A-module we started with, because um, that requires these co-evaluation maps and evaluation maps and such. So, so for this um, to actually give V star the structure of a dual of V in the category of A modules, what do we need? Well. The evaluation and co-evaluation maps are kind of given by what they are in vector spaces. But we need that those maps are actually maps of A modules. So we need that the evaluation and the co-evaluation are maps of A modules. So let's think about uh, what's required for that. Um, OK, so to make this more sensible, I'm going to need some notation. Um, and so this notation is sort of also an exercise, as I'll explain. Um, <clears throat> So I want to redefine the action of um, A, this is some element of the algebra, on the dual as follows. So I'm defining a map from V dual to V dual. I'm going to read these diagrams top to bottom. and. I'm going to let A come in and act on the left, maybe try to do it in a different color. So here, 
I could let an element come in and act. So this is what I want to define. I want to define what it means for A to act on V dual. And I could define this as follows. Um, I'm going to, so this is V dual. And I can use the evaluation and co-evaluation maps to write down the composite, this composite. And then what I'm going to do is I'm going to let A act on V, but after I applied S to it. So just to be clear, this picture here is some map of vector spaces um, given by just these composites with the ordinary evaluation co-evaluation. And then in the middle, I just act on the vector, whatever vector I have there, by S of A. So this defines some map of vector spaces from V star to V star. And that's what I'm defining as the action of A on V star. So that's some definition. The exercise is to, to just to check that that actually agrees with what I wrote down in formulas there. That those really do define the same action. OK, so now with this notation, we can, we can check what's required for these to be maps of A modules. So suppose, let's start with the evaluation. So we want evaluation to be a module map. So what does that mean? So here's a picture of the evaluation map. Again, I'm reading down. I have V star tensor V mapping to C. And I'm acting by some element A. And what does that mean? Well, by definition, I take the coproduct and act on the two different pieces. And what do I need to check? I need to check that that's the same. So here, I acted, and then I did the evaluation. I need to check that that's the same as first doing the evaluation and then acting. So I'm asking if this is the same as acting down here. And the action of A on C is just via taking the co-unit. So I'm asking if those two things are the same. So let's check. So here, by definition, I put a little curly Q in here. So this is V star V. And I do the co-product and act over there, and then act in the middle there. But now I can use the um, relationship between evaluation and co-evaluation to kill these two bumps. So this is equal to thing where I first, oh, I forgot. I forgot to put my antipode in here. So let me denote the antipode by putting a little crossbar, so just on this one leg, because that's what I defined it when I was acting on the dual. So that's equal to this. And so here, I just took V, and I acted first by this um, line, and then by this line. That's the same as multiplying them and then acting, because it's an action. So this is the same as coming in, co-multiplying doing the antipode on one leg, and then multiplying, and then acting. And now these two things are supposed to be the same. And so this is true if I have a relation actually in the algebra A, namely, I co-multiply, do the antipode, and multiply. If that's equal to just co-multiplying, and then really to land back in the same place, I need to include whatever scalar I got back into the algebra by the co-unit. And so this is the Hopf condition. Um, well, it's really sort of the first of two Hopf conditions, and then an exercise is that if I had instead done the antipode on the top and assumed that that was equal to this, that that implies that the co-evaluation 
is a module map. And so once we have, and so I'll call this hop condition two. Okay. Um, so I'll continue way over here. So in fact, that whole story had to do with building a right dual for V. But um, we probably want our category, we want every object to have both a right dual and a left dual. And so I'll just note to build a left dual. So we could run the whole story again, trying to build a left dual instead of a right dual. And the conditions we'll, we get are the following. We end up using, um, so I need some new notation here. So let me put um, an x for the inverse of the antipode. So this x denotes s inverse. I didn't actually say it, but um, I might have wanted to ask that this map S be invertible. Um, and so I can do S inverse and then twist the two factors and then multiply. And I can ask that that be the same as just taking the co-unit followed by the unit. And similarly, on the other side, I could take the inverse down there and ask that that as well be this composite. Um, anyway, it turns out these are actually consequences of the other, act, uh, of the other things I've already said, provided I add someplace the condition that S actually fix the unit of the algebra, so that S actually take the unit to the unit, then you can derive these from the conditions over there for S. So all that said, we can write down a definition now. A Hopf algebra um, is a bi-algebra. with an invertible anti-homomorph algebra, anti-homomorphism. Um, <clears throat> and that's also a co-algebra, co-anti-homomorphism. That just means that if you do S and then co-multiply, it's the same as co-multiplying and then doing S on both factors and switching them. Um, and then all that should satisfy Hopf condition one and Hopf condition two from down there. And that's all you need to, that's all you need to say. Okay, um, and so then the, just to state it explicitly, what have we seen? Well, we've seen that if A is a Hopf algebra, then repeating everything, A mod is a tensor category with both left and right duals, which is what we wanted. So what's the more general story going to be? We're going to be building some Hopf algebras coming from quantum groups. And then this story produces, shows us that the representation category of those Hopf algebras um, are tensor categories. I'm lying a little bit in ways we'll see, but anyway. Um, so we're going to produce these tensor categories. And that's the start of the structure of a three-dimensional field theory. It's what we saw just on these first few pieces of geometric data. Um, and we're going to put more structure yet on these Hopf algebras. Okay. Uh, 
Um, let's see. OK, maybe I'll skip right to some examples. So. So maybe I'll just do two examples. So first example, suppose we have some group G, and we can take the group ring of G. So that's some unital algebra. And now I need to tell you, um, well, just to be explicit, so the algebra structure is just the usual multiplication on the group ring. And the unit I'll denote by E, which is just the identity element in the group G. And then I need to tell you what the coproduct is. So the coproduct is going to take an element G to H tensor H. So this is the coproduct delta. And then the co-unit is going to take an element G to 1 for all elements of the group G. Um, did I give the co-unit a name? I don't think so. I guess I've been calling it epsilon, maybe. Um, and now I just need to tell you what the antipode is. So the last piece of data is the antipode S, which takes G to G inverse. And you'll see that I haven't specified the data everywhere. I've just specified it on some generators, but um, the conditions then allow you to determine what it is on the whole, uh, on the whole algebra. Um, so maybe it's worth um, putting in a little caution, which is that C of G is also Frobenius algebra if you put in a, a different coproduct instead. So if instead you map G, sorry, map H to the sum of, over G of G inverse tensor GH, and the, that's delta, and the co-unit sends E to 1 and sends all other group elements to 0, so epsilon. Here, say, I'm thinking of a finite group. Um, so it's really important. I mean, the, depending on what kind of coproduct you have, it might be interacting in a Frobenius way or a Hopf way, and these things are very different. Might say more about that tomorrow. So, what's the second example I want to mention is the universal enveloping algebra. Oh, so anyway, I should say so this. So this now tells us how to tensor together representations of a group. Because now, if I take some representation of this algebra, I know how to tensor them and how to take dual representations based on the structure. And that's really what I needed in order to be able to take tensors of, of group representations. And it's, you know, it's, not, it's often not made very explicit because it's quite an elementary notion. We think tensoring representations, but in fact, it really depends on um, this coproduct interacting in this nice way with the algebra structure. So the second example, if I have a universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra with um, the usual multiplication and the unit is the unit one of the enveloping algebra, and then the coproduct, if I have G is some element of the Lie algebra, I take this to G tensor 1 plus 1 tensor G. And then the co-unit takes G to 0 and 1 to 1. So that's epsilon. This is delta. And then the antipode takes G to minus G. So I claim that that gives the universal enveloping algebra of G the structure of a Hopf algebra. And again, this is really what explains why we can tensor together representations of Lie algebra, um, is the fact that 
this coproduct interacts in a nice way with the product on the universal enveloping algebra. Um, okay, well, I'll stop there.